Well, good evening, Brian, and welcome to the Lodge Hope of Karachi, number 337, and our weekly lockdown lecture, Zoom lecture series. This is meeting number 32, Brian, and it's a great pleasure to have our members and our visitors with us. As usual, can I remind you all of the Grand Lodge of Scotland guidelines for Zoom meetings, and can I ask you to have your video camera on and uh, a name within the screen so we know who you are. Uh, can I ask you to sign the virtual tile on our Facebook pages, uh, just so we have a record for posterity and the history of the Lodge going forward. Thank you very much in advance, Brian. Uh, as usual, can uh, anyone who's got any questions this evening, can you please put them in the chat and we will have a moderated questions and answer session afterwards with our speaker. Uh, I would encourage you to partake in the conversation afterwards uh, within the Facebook pages. Uh, and if you have to leave or go early, this is being recorded, Brent, and it will be available on the Lodge Hope of Karachi YouTube channel later on this evening. Well, Brian, it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, another speaker along this evening. He will be known to many of you. Uh, he's been a regular attender at these lockdown lecture series, and it is brother Grant McLeod. He's a past master at Houston St. Johnston, number 242 through in the West. He's a past master of our sister research lodge, the Anchor Lodge of Research. And he's a past provincial grand secretary of Renfrewshire East, probably one of the most hardworking Brian in the province, the provincial grand secretaries. Uh, but particularly for our research and learning, uh, he also has uh, some extracurricular activities that he gets up to. And he's been the editor of the Cross Keys magazine that has been published for many years. And Brian, if you've not seen that, please uh, Google that. I'm sure Grant will share more information with it with us this evening. And he's about to become the co-editor of the Ashland Magazine, the independent Scottish Masonic magazine. And we wish him all the very best with that in the future. Uh, so with my, without much further ado, it gives me the greatest of pleasure to hand over to Brother Grant McLeod, who's going to tell us about the life and times of Brother Lord Kitchener. Uh, thanks, Gordon. Um, can, I, can I just say that <laughs> if I disappear, I'll come back on right away. The, my bandwidth has been coming up, has uh, been slow. I'm changing over to uh, BT, I actually just changed this morning, so it's going to be a couple of weeks. So if I do suddenly disappear, I'll come back in. So please don't just run away unless I have actually finished. Um, I'll just share the, the screen. Yeah, you can. Okay, can everybody see that? No, it's not come up yet, Grant. Okay, is that, is that okay for everybody? Not yet. Yeah. Can everybody hear me okay? I'm, I'm in town for some reason, just... You're quite right. uh, okay. Star Wars sounding. Uh, what I'll do, I'll maybe go and chase my daughter because she's on. She's to uh, Santos just now. Um, One of the challenges, Bern, of modern technology. And I suppose... Uh, Brother McLeod lives in one of those uh, extra special lockdown areas where no one can actually get out to the pub. So uh, the brand width will be getting uh, chewed up uh, through on the West Coast. Good evening, Gordon. Joseph. Hi, here. Joseph. Welcome. Thank you. Right, here we come. That's it coming up now, Grant. Oh, 
Okay. Right. Can you hear me okay? Is that fine? I can hear you better now, Grant. You're saying that you're, you've started sharing screen, but it's still a blank screen. As ever, Brian, please just bear with us when we try to resolve these technical challenges that we're facing with Grant's bandwidth. It is a great delight to see 76 Brian here this evening. Just as we're waiting then, Brian, next week we have invited Brother Dr. Reuther, who is an English Freemason, and he's going to come along and give us a story about Freemasonry and the American Civil War. We had a little bit of that when Brother Moses Gomez uh, joined us and talked about the Underground Railroad. Uh, so it'll be really interesting to hear both sides of the story from the Confederate and the Union side. That's Grant just coming back in. Uh, the following week, I'm just waiting for confirmation of our guest speaker, but then we have a variety of speakers right up until the 15th of December, Brian. And on the 15th of December, I propose that we then take our Christmas break because uh, I'm not too sure that your, your wives and partners, etc., will be too enamored that you come along to a, a Lodge Hope of Karachi Zoom meeting two nights before Christmas, uh, albeit that you guys may prefer that uh, if we're still in some sort of lockdown. And then we'll come back in the new year uh, and continue until we hope that we'll have some light and we can get back to some sort of nor normality and out and about. But no doubt our heads of orders will uh, give us that information in due course. Grant, are you with us again? Grant, are you back with us? Well, Brian, I might have tempted fate when I said that I spoke to Grant this afternoon. You might not have to hear from me. Uh, if it's okay with you, we'll give him another three or four minutes to try and resolve his bandwidth. But if not, we might have to revert to uh, the, the backup presentation. Okay, Brian, Brother Grant McLeod. Right, brethren, <laughs> finally, ho hopefully we'll get through this. Now, what I was going to look at uh, with Lord Kitchener was his Masonic activities in conjunction with his military roles. And as you can see, there's a, he's got a whole host of honours attached to his name, far too many to, to really go through. So um, I thought we'd start with uh, 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 a picture where, uh, I think this moved on now, um, a typical picture of Lord Kitchener taking a salute, um, and here he is on horseback in some far off exotic land. Now, the exotic land here turns out to be 
Pakistan, which perhaps today is not as exotic as it, as it used to be. However, there is a lot more to this soldier and to this mason than just the, the fancy uniforms that many people probably uh, put uh, with Kitchener himself. Horatio Herbert Kitchener was born in 1850 in County Kerry, which is way down south in Ireland. Um, and obviously this was an area where the British Army uh, served at that time. His father was a career soldier, and it obvious at an early age that Kitchener was going to follow in his father's footsteps. He visited his father during the Franco-Prussian War as an ambulance man, probably very similar to Churchill, who had visited uh, the war scenario, um, not as a soldier, first of all, but as a war correspondent. He was, this was the only action that Kitchener was able to see since Britain at this time in the Franco-Prussian War was neutral. And he then, therefore joined the French army in 1870. A year later, he joined the Royal Engineers and was involved in surveying the Holy Land, work which should really not be underestimated because the grid system which he used, which he really started, um, and the data is still used by architects to this day. In 1882, he was posted to Egypt, and like many officers, his job was to train the natives and build a real network. And who would think that 100 years later or so, this strategy of arming and training locals would come back to haunt us? In 1883, Kitchener was initiated in La Concordia Lodge in Cairo, age 33. And although this is not 100% certain, because there's a handwritten note in the Grand Lodge records in London, which states that he may have been initiated into Star in the East Lodge in the same year. Unfortunately, both were erased in 1890, and no records remain of this period of either lodge. This was actually an uneasy period for Britain. There was a great deal of unrest in the Sudan, which culminated in the, form, in the fall of Khartoum in 1885, the same year they affiliated to Bulwer Lodge, and the standard is shown in the right-hand side there, which was the most senior lodge in Egypt at that time. By 1895, Britain was fed up with the rebels and Kitchener was tasked with squashing them. This, however, took a further three years. During this time, Kitchener became even more active in the craft, and perhaps this was seen as a, an escape really from the turmoils of uh, living abroad and uh, uh, being at war um, with a, a great many countries uh, that Britain had. And like most of the Britain today, uh, we go to the lodge and uh, we get away from our daily routines and work and can have a, a fairly stress-free situation. However, um, in 1885, he was one of 13 founders, which uh, seems strange, um, considering Drury Lane Lodge was in London. And it appears that he was the founder of this lodge and never actually attended it. Now, why would that be? Well, perhaps the lodge wanted some dignitaries to get it started in order to raise their, their image. Uh, some of the other founder members was included an admiral, the solicitor general for London, an Aero, and was also later to see the initiation of Robert Scott on his way down to the South Atlantic. In 1892 was, was his first venture into a Royal Arts chapter and was also given uh, commander in chief of the Egyptian army. In 1895, he was the founding master of Fataya Lodge, which operated under the National Grand Lodge of Egypt, and was awarded the rank of past senior district grand warden under the National Grand Lodge of, of Egypt. The following year, um, honours really do begin to flow. Um, it took him a year to become the first principal, so obviously he didn't go through all the offices. Um, so he was first principal and also um, awarded the, the rank of third grand principal um, again under the National Grand Lodge of Egypt. In 1897, he became a, an honorary past junior Grand Warden of the United Grand Lodge of England, and at the same time, a past Grand Scribe of the Grand Chapter of England. Um, I'm not sure if that was because the, the craft and the Royal Arts ranks, as they, they do today, seem to work in parallel. Um, it might just be that the, the Grand Chapter wanted him as well. In 1898, he became an honorary member of uh, Edinburgh uh, Mary's Chapel Number no. One, 
and also can and Gatecoe winning number two. Um, and at this point as well, he takes his first steps into to mark masonry. Um, and again, it may seem rather strange for us Scots that he joined the Royal Arch and then the, the mark. But remember, in England, the mark degree is a completely separate order and is not attached to uh, Royal Arch chapters at all. Um, and he became the junior warden for the Grand Lodge of Mark Masters, um, or Mark Master Masons in uh, North Africa. Also at this time, um, Britain recaptured the Sudan after the Battle of Omdurman to avenge the death of General Gordon. And at this point, he was given, Kitchener was given a, a peerage, she was given the, the title of Baron. This was a huge success. 11,000 of the Mahdi's had been killed, uh, as opposed to only 48 losses of the British Army and the Egyptian Army. At this point, he now acquired the title of Kitchener of Khartoum, for which he is very well known, and was also the Governor General of Sudan. However, he didn't re real didn't look at, at this as a, with a, a hard hand. Um, he ordered mosques to be rebuilt and Friday was to continue as a holy day. He also prevented the missionaries from converting the Muslims into Christians. And at the same time, he managed to build 700 miles of railway. So it was still very much a case of the hearts and minds of the local population, which is how he always viewed uh, success in the long term. In 1899, he was appointed Governor General of the Sudan and installed as the District Grand Master. And the, the jewel, as shown, was the jewel that was struck to commemorate that particular event. The District Grand Lodge uh, of Sudan at that point contained four lodges. At the end of the year, he was made Chief of Staff with the rank of Major General, along with Brother Lord Roberts, who was made Commander in Chief of the British Forces. In 1900, he was promoted to Lieutenant General and became Commander-in-Chief during the Second Boer War. And unsurprisingly, he attended a lodge meeting in Bloemfontein just after the British occupation, along with Brother Lord Roberts. The first meeting he was due to attend, um, for some reason, something had come up, very possibly on a, a military context, but so much so that this was actually reported in the local paper, which stated that the communication was received from Right Worshipful Brother Lord Kitchener, expressing his regret at not being able to attend the meeting, intimating that it was his, his intention to visit the lodge in the near future. This they managed in the, very, in the following week, when both he and Brother Roberts signed a loyal res resolution to be sent to the Prince of Wales concerning Queen Victoria's health. This lodge continues to meet in Bloemfontein. In 1902, he was posted to India once again. He became Commander-in-Chief for India and promoted to the rank of Field Marshal. He immediately joined Khartoum Lodge, again operating under the English Constitution, and became the District Grand Master of the Punjab in India. This was a title, this was a, a, a role, it was not because of who he was, but because the particular district Grand Lodge was looking for leadership, and who, who better than Lord Kitchener. The same year, he also attended British Union Lodge in Ipswich and became an honorary member, as well as been given the freedom of the borough. Also present at that meeting was uh, Sir Charles Dalrymple, past Grand Master Mason of Scotland. In 1903, um, he was once again posted to India and immediately joined the Malayan Lodge. Um, and uh, the same year, just a wee bit later on, he became the founder of Kitchener Lodge, of which three or four lodges took his name. Um, and again, this was another English Constitution Lodge, and the jewel is shown. Um, his aide de camp, at that time Captain Gerald Fitzgerald, is shown, <coughs> was initiated in 1906 and uh, went through his degrees uh, the following year. Um, which Kitchener had attended. Um, both uh, his ADC and Lord Kitchener uh, affiliated to a number of lodges um, at the same time. So much so that his um, aide de camp, or really uh, his personal military secretary, uh, were great friends and tend to do everything together. So much so that um, he actually saved Kitchener's life in 1912 in a plot to assassinate him in Cairo. Um, this event is actually well recorded 
and it would appear that Captain Fitzgerald put his body in front of Lord Kitchener's, which stumbled the assassin enough to uh, be disarmed um, at that time. And <coughs> there's a lot of um, aide-de-camps I know that um, would certainly not do that these days. So I'd like to think that perhaps it was the Masonic vows that uh, Brother Fitzgerald had taken that he felt it was his duty to protect Lord Kitchener. Um, this particular photo was taken from the, an old London paper called The Sphere. Um, and again, another very distinguished photograph of Lord Kitchener. Um, and this was going through, um, th th this had to give a, a complete uh, army reform. Um, and some of the things were reorganising the army um, of native soldiers into general service units, I suppose similar to the Scottish Division today. But what it did do was allow Sikh regiments to work in the south and also the Madras regiment to work in the Punjab, which had never happened before. He also established a staff college and a system of promotion within staff college is still in use today. So a great many of the things that Lord Kitchener did had lasting effects. Um, they weren't just uh, whims, really. Probably one of the most famous initiations attached with Kitchener was the Amir of uh, Afghanistan. Uh, Lord Kitchener was his proposer, and he assisted at the initiation, the passing and the raising of the Amir in Lodge Concordia in Kolkata. All three degrees had to take place in the same night, and this was the first time any Afghani ruler had ever left the country. Um, he was so taken by Freemasonry that the Amir had all the rituals translated into Afghani so that he could then study them at a later point. Because his knowledge of the Masonic affiliation could be used against him, uh, by his enemies in Afghanistan, the Amir's membership had to be kept secret from his staff, his soldiers, basically his entire entourage, and also the public. However, the Amir was so proud of being a Freemason that he eventually publicly announced it, and that he had joined and told his people that he had joined Freemasonry um, in order to benefit Afghanistan. This is actually just a copy of the billet um, that, that was sent out, and you can see at the bottom um, the proposer was Lord Kitchener, and he was seconded by my brother, Sir uh, William Burkett. Um, the, the lodge consisted mainly of military officers and senior, senior civil servants, um, such as the Lieutenant Governor of Bengal, the Archdeacon of Calcutta, the Accountant General of Bengal, um, the meeting started at 9.30, it took two and a half hours, so it actually finished, the three degrees finished at midnight. And you have to wonder why it started so late, but I think um, with the, the brethren in question, it may well be the, due to the nature of their jobs. And the same time here um, is now in possession of Freemasons Hall in, in London. Um, in charge of the visit was actually a, a Lieutenant Colonel Sir Henry McMahon, who was the Chief Commissioner in India, um, of which there is actually a lodge number 3262 that was named after him, um, that initially met in London, but today the, that lodge now meets in London. And he expressed the, the feeling towards the British people of the, the Amir, and I'll just quote a couple of things. Um, so Brother Sir Henry McMahon has said, I am convinced that his experience of Freemasonry with us played no small part in creating that trust and preserving it unweakened through the years to come. Time after time, missions were sent to Kabul from Turkey and Germany, offering the mere alluring temptations of territory and power. If he would only take the winning side, as they tried to uh, explain it, the winning side against uh, Britain in this war, not only did he hold out loyally, but thanks to his firm hand in his country and the border tribes, our northwest Indian frontier enjoyed complete peace throughout the war, so much so that Britain was able to denude India of British and Indian forces and send them to other fields of war, namely against the Germans. The value of this to us was almost incalculable, but as alas was soon proven when within a few weeks, the end of the Great War, our loyal friend and ally was struck down by the hand of the assassin. The firm hand that kept peace on our frontier was moved. Afghanistan turned against us, 
and British troops want once again sent rushing back in great strength to India. If this had not been the case, the war uh, uh, might have been uh, much longer. Um, so it's, it's one of these strange accounts that um, I asked a couple of uh, historians um, who are uh, my colleagues about um, this particular aspect, and they knew nothing about this at all. And you just wonder how many real aspects of Masonic history may explain why some things have happened in history. And yet, um, this is an example where very few people seem to know why did the Amir hold out, and it might well just be because of his Masonic affiliations. Um, this photograph is the only one I could find <coughs> of uh, Lord Kitchener in Royal Arts Regalia. Um, this was in the Sudan chapter in 1910. And who would have thought that only four years later, he would be made an arrow and at the outbreak of the war become Secretary of State for War. This was actually the first time that any soldier had ever held this particular post. When he, when he accepted the post, he was quoted as saying, to the, the country, you have to perform a task which you will need uh, your courage, your energy, and your patience. Remember that the honour of the British Army depends on your individual conduct. It will be your duty not only to set an example of discipline and perfect steadiness under fire, but also to maintain the most friendly relations with those with whom you are helping in the struggle. Do your duty bravely, fear God, and honour the king. Stirring words indeed. This photograph, <coughs> now if you notice the date, it's actually the 7th of June, um, and it's just a couple of days after um, the dreadful news about Hampshire, uh, HMS Hampshire sinking. Um, this was Lord uh, Kitchener at Broom Park, which was his home. Um, and he is seen here with a, a load of injured soldiers um, who he had invited to come along to his house in Kent um, so that he could be entertained for the day, been fed and so on. Um, and they were brought in from um, various military hospitals. And you think, how many people of that rank today would ever do that with the, the rank and file of the, the British Army? Um, and again, I would like to think that this was probably um, Lord Kitchener and his Masonic principles coming to the fore where he really did believe and care for the men that were under his charge. Sadly, however, on the 5th of June, HMS Hampshire struck a mine. He was on a visit to, to Russia. The Prime Minister had posted him to, to Russia to continue the, the war effort against Germany. And on the particular night in question, which was uh, horrific conditions, um, the, the ship went down with a loss of 737 souls, including Lord Kitchener and his trusted ADC. Now, I know there have been a, a lot of conspiracy theories surrounding what happened that night, but um, a book a couple of years ago um, by, uh, I'm sure his surname was Laws, um, had, came to the conclusion that it was just uh, an unfortunate accident. Um, which during that, that period, many ships were going down with, with landmines. Um, in December of 1916, just at the end of this year, <coughs> a new Secretary of State uh, for War had been chosen, and this was the 17th Earl of Derby, who was the Provincial Grand Master of East Lanx, and I'm sure Lord Kitchener would have approved most, most thoroughly. Um, a number of the papers, obviously, um, this was, was main news, um, and the, the news, I think, shocked the whole country. Um, and the, I think in terms of what, what the, the British public thought, um, I don't think there was any, any, uh, any ideas of any kind of uh, untoward uh, behaviour. I think it was just they, they realised that they had lost possibly one of the best uh, Secretary of States. Um, and saying that, a great deal of uh, bad press had gone his way. Um, but um, looking at the whole thing, um, I think Lord Kitchener um, had done a, a superb job um, from a, a military point of view. Um, his aide de camp, who was now a lieutenant colonel, um, was one of the few whose bodies were washed up, and he is now buried in Eastbourne. And for some reason, his gravestone, his memorial, was actually designed by none other than Macintosh from Glasgow. The memorial in Orkney 
um, is a, a very fitting uh, tower, uh, 15 metres high, uh, can be seen from the sea and overlooks where the, the ship went down. Um, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle um, had said that the memory of something vast and elemental coming suddenly and going strangely, a mighty spirit, leaving traces in its earthly passage. Um, again, just shows you the, the number of people who um, were shocked by, by his death. A hundred years later, um, and, well, as you can see the tower on top of the, uh, the rocks, a um, hundred years later, um, a full wall was made with all 737 uh, names and also um, one particular panel for the members on the mission to Russia. And again, you can see uh, on the left hand side, you've got Kitchener, you've got Fitzgerald, um, and the others were part of the, the team to meet the, the Russian military uh, to continue the, the, the war effort. Um, and it's certainly a very fitting memorial. And this, this was done 100 years uh, after the actual uh, event. Um, on the left hand side, we have a prison. Um, this was a king and queen going past St Paul's Cathedral. The king wore full service uniform. The queen wore a dark velvet and, dark and black ostrich feathers. All officers had to have swords drawn. Services were held all over uh, Britain. They were held all over Europe where they could do it at that point. And the programme on the right hand side is a typical programme from uh, Paris. Um, again, to commemorate the life of Lord Kitchener. He was immensely popular with his men, um, albeit he was a stern taskmaster, but most of the, the, the good leaders within the military um, are not pushovers, and the men do respect that. He led his men from the front, he shunned publicity. Despite this, lodges were named after him all over, and these are some of the, the examples um, shown. Kitchener Lodge number 3402 was initially in uh, Cairo, now meets in the Kalia Garrison in Cyprus uh, to this day. Um, and it's very appropriate, I suppose, that there is a lodge in Cyprus because this is actually where Kitchener did his first mapping survey in 1878. Kitchener shares the place with everyone else who died in the war. And it's good to see that um, after his death, a grant uh, was made to the medical school at the University of Khartoum, the city which had, he had subjugated for the empire. With the coming of peace, Kitchener scholarships became available to surviving soldiers who had their education disrupted by the war service. And in fact, in, the, in that particular lodge, in the 2998 lodge, uh, bearing his name, um, two of the brethren um, were VC holders. Um, this screen um, shows uh, Lord Kitchener um, in St Paul's, um, and uh, this is uh, the memorial. Unfortunately, I think this memorial tends to be closed to the public uh, most of the time. Um, I'm not quite sure why, but um, I suppose if you do get a chance to see it, it's certainly worth seeing it with two soldiers overlooking um, the, the memorial. Um, this is the equestrian statue of Lord Kitchener. Um, it was in Khartoum in the Sudan. Obviously, in the recent times, um, things change, and I won't mention anything about statues uh, being vandalised these days, um, but the British realised that um, with the, the current regime in the Sudan, uh, I'm not sure when this was moved, possibly after the Second World War, that it probably wouldn't last too long. So it was uh, removed. And today it can now be seen um, in Kent at uh, Kitchener Barracks in Chatham, um, home of the, the Royal Engineers, I believe, which would make sense, which was his initial unit. The other memorial is actually Kitchener Park in Queensland, Australia. And this is where the, the troop review is conducted every year by the Australian Army. Um, probably the most well-known memorial um, is down in Horse Cards in London. Um, and again, it's a I think a particularly good uh, image of Kitchener, no hat, he's standing there obviously, uh, could be in the middle of an office, could be trying to look through strategies, but it's probably one that he would have approved of. And I think although the task overwhelmed him, it would probably have overwhelmed any man to conduct the British Army in the First World War. This was a new type of warfare, 
I saw the introduction of mechanised warfare, chemical weapons, and saw two professional armies pitted against each other. That was a huge, huge task. Um, this particular picture, um, 1919, was the, the, the Kitchener Memorial Homes. Um, and the new Commander Memorial, I think there's now a charity for the Memorial Homes. Um, and this was one of the first ones. Um, and this was for ex-servicemen and servicewomen um, when they came back from the war, if they had no place or if they needed some place to, to go to, to be looked after. Um, and a great deal of uh, money had been put into the, these memorial memorial homes. It's called a holiday home, but um, it was a more of a, a long-term basis. And today, more recently, um, we have first aid covers. We've got two pound coins that commemorate Lord Kitchener. So to a certain extent, he hasn't been forgotten. Um, he is still um, in the public mind. Possibly youngsters today might not know who he was. They might just uh, think he was somebody in the First World War. But I think a lot of my generation and, and certainly older know exactly who Lord Kitchener was, albeit they probably are not aware of how involved he was with the Masonic Draft. Um, and here we have um, just another couple of lodges that are still op operating today. Um, one is in Bolton, uh, Lodge, uh, Kitchener Lodge 3788, um, and this, the second lodge is the, the one in Cyprus. Um, the photograph here is actually the third Lord Kitchener. Kitchener that was the first Earl. He had no family, so it went through um, his brother, and I think the third Earl was a... Uh, a, a, a grand nephew and so on. Um, and he accepted honorary membership into Kitchener Lodge 3788, um, the one with the, the banner there. Um, and he died only in 2011. Um, the title um, went to a niece, and this was one of the first times that the title had gone to a female. Um, the Queen had to intervene here to make sure that the, the title um, was passed on because um, apparently that particular title um, should only go to male heirs. Um, however, the Queen did intervene and the, the, the title Earl Kitchener still exists today, um, albeit and, uh, with a, a great, great niece of some sort. Uh, finally, brethren, um, this is a famous recruiting uh, poster. Obviously, the, the logo at the bottom wasn't then, um, but I think we can say quite safely that Lord Kitchener uh, really did do his duty when called upon. He was a very active mason, and he, it was clear that he took pride in the craft and took his le the lessons to his heart. Um, many people say that uh, we have famous Freemasons, and they just happened to be famous, uh, or they just happened, sorry, they just happened to be a Freemason, um, and, and they're famous. Whereas I would say in this particular case, uh, Lord Kitchener was a, very much a Freemason and he just happened to be famous because of his military ranks. There's a very nice, just to close, a very nice uh, excerpt from the quarterly communication of the United Grand Lodge of England. On the 7th of June, two days after his death, uh, 1916. Brethren, we were all taken aback yesterday when the news arrived of the loss of our distinguished brother, Lord Kitchener. We owe him a debt of gratitude, which can never be repaid and we will hold his name in honour from now onwards. Lord Kitchener sleeps in the proudest grave in which he could have been laid, in the sea, surrounded and supported by those who have so nobly upheld the name of Great Britain. Grand Lodge expresses its profound sorrow at the tragic and untimely death of right worshipful brother, Field Marshal Earl Kitchener of Khartoum. Well, I think we should be very proud to have brother Lord Kitchener as a fellow brother. Brethren, thank you very much. Um, I hope that was of interest. Brother Grant McLeod, past master, I think I can say on behalf of all of the Brethren, it was of great interest to hear not only about the bits that we probably all, are all aware of about his exploits as one of our nation's leading military men, but also his connection to our beloved craft. So on behalf of the members of Lodge Hope of Karachi and all our visitors, Grant, thank you very much for all your efforts this evening. And Brian, I'm sure, like me, I'm glad that we persevered through the bandwidth <laughs> challenges at the beginning uh, to get to this stage and to hear 
a very interesting lecture. Uh, Grant, as usual, there's always uh, a couple of questions and the, the, there are in here. I, the first one comes from Brother uh, Michael Monroe over in Paris. Uh, you mentioned uh, Macintosh at one point. Uh, are you talking about Rennie Macintosh? Uh, yes, Charles, Rennie Macintosh. Yes. Uh -huh. Yep. I don't know why he des he uh, designed the, the the stone. I don't know what the connection was, um, but yes, it was Charles Rennie Macintosh. Yep. Okay. Out of interest, was he a brother? I don't think so. No, I don't think so. No, certainly never come across anything in Glasgow records. Okay. Hey. You no, sorry. Hey, Chaz Black's asking, great talk. Did Kitchener ever meet Kipling in the lodge? I don't know. Um, I've certainly never come across um, any connection with Kipling. Um, I've had a few, um, I've done this lecture three times and after each one I've, uh, I've amended it from things that uh, Brother Brennan have mentioned to me. So that, that's a, a, a connection I've never thought of and, and you would think with the, the Kipler connection in India it probably is probable. Um, so um, the answer is I don't know but I'll go away and see if I can find anything. Yeah, I, I think I could add to that as well. I've been doing a lot about Kipling just now because I'm doing some research uh, into uh, the Victoria Cross and India and the silent cities for the, the Remembrance presentations. And I certainly haven't come across mm. a connection to them. They certainly mixed in the same circles, uh, but I just don't think they were mm. ever together at any one point. Uh, no, no. Ian McIntosh, always a wealth of knowledge. Uh, comes in with Brother George Mitchell Hunter of Lodge Dalhousie, number 679, also went down with HMS Hampshire. He was an engineer serving on board. So again, right. I, right. and okay. again, Lodge Dalhousie takes its name from uh, Panmure, who was uh, the instigator behind the Victoria Cross. So connections within connections. Uh, Derek Elder, a uh, very interesting talk, and I'm sorry I arrived late. It's no problem, Derek, you're here with us. Was it mentioned that Kitchener in Ontario was renamed from Berlin in 1916 to commemorate him? No, I think Kitchener um, in Ontario, um, I think that was uh, from the 1850s, 1860s, it was, it was named. Um, so I don't, I don't know if it was a, a, the Kitchener family from way before, if Kitchener's had maybe gone out there, um, but it, it wasn't named after the, the first arrow, no. Okay. Uh, Derek's also kindly shared a paper from Yasha Berensoner about Kitchener, and I will put that up on the Facebook later on this evening, Brian, for you to have a look at. Um... Gordon, Ray Borland from Canada. Hi, Ray. Actually, I lived in Kitchener, Ontario for... 25 years. Uh, it was actually named after Lord Kitchener. Um, it was changed in uh, 1916 as a result of the war. They did no, they no longer wanted to have uh, Berlin and that's why they changed it. It must have gone along with the same time that Kitchener died. I'm pretty sure that was the case. Oh, thank you, Ray. Yeah, if it was 1916, that's absolutely right. Um, it's just, this is where you don't rely on Wikipedia. Um, <laughs> I had mentioned that uh, Kitchener had, uh, in Ontario, had been in existence from the middle of the, the 19th century. So, Oh, good grief. I, I, well, I, I had automatically assumed that it was the, the name. It might well be the town had existed under another name um so that that's that's probably uh, what's happened it has changed in 1916. yes the well, area the, the the area was called berlin because of the uh german and and uh dutch people who came up from the uh the revolutionary war they were loyalists and they uh -huh. came up the grand river and got up to the Kitchener area and started to settle in there. Right, well that's good to know because I'm, I'm now going to add that onto the, the talk. 
Ray, thank you very much. One of the mantras we have here at the Lodge Hope of Karachi is hashtag daily advancement. So Grant, I think uh, that's your little bit of a, your hashtag daily advancement uh, with that little bit. And again, Brian, it's great to see everyone putting in. I, Jim Gardner is telling us that uh, Kipling was a member of Lodge Hope and Persevere in 782 in the Punjab. Uh, yep, that's great. Jim, thank you for that. Uh, Joe Priest, another one of these military members. Uh, so Jim was uh, one of our guest speakers who spoke about St. Pat's and Joe Priest is a past master of St. Pat's 295 the Irish Constitution. And Joe goes on to say, I've had the privilege of visiting Lord Kitchener Lodge number 3402 on many occasions during tours of Cyprus. Lodges banded together to raise funds to rebuild it after it was destroyed by a storm. Joe, thank mm -hmm. you very much for that. Uh, and I'm sure there was uh, many demijohns of Coccinelli drunk on those occasions, uh, <laughs> or whiskey sours, or brandy sours, I think. Uh, Alistair Marshall, excellent and interesting talk. Well done, Grant. Uh, so, Brian, uh, there's no further questions in the chat. I uh, just once again, Grant, can I thank you so much for uh, a very interesting uh, presentation on a very interesting man and I'm sure many of us will uh, maybe not look at Wikipedia as much uh, but take it with a pinch of salt what, what's there. Uh, Brian, next week, as I said earlier, when we were having the bandwidth problems, we've got brother Dr. Rother. He is a, an English Freemason who has won a, a, a few uh, present, uh, presentations for his lecture work. And he's going to join us and talk about Freemasonry and the American Civil War. Uh, and I think we've, we've all heard the stories about uh, brother, uh, supporting brother in that war. Uh, so I hope that you can join us next week. Brian, as ever, can I thank you for your support of the Lockdown Lecture Series here by the Lodge Hope of Karachi, number 337. Please sign our virtual tile and please look at our YouTube channel. Uh, many of you will know that the History and Heritage Group of the Grand Lodge of Scotland, they've just completed their 10 series lecture on the oldest lodges in Scotland. They're all available on the YouTube channel as well if you want to go back and we will always keep you informed of what the History and Heritage Group's up to and I can assure you Brian there's some exciting times ahead from them uh, in this virtual Zoom world. Brian once again thank you all for your support. Please unmute yourself and say your thank yous to this evening's wonderful speaker Brother Grant McLeod. Thanks, Grant. Thanks, Rich. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, brethren. Thank you. 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 Thank Thank you very much indeed, Grant. That was excellent. Thank you. Thanks, David. Thank you, Grant. Appreciate it. Thanks very much. Well worth waiting for. Yeah, well, thanks, Grant. Thank you so much indeed. again. Goodbye, Grant. Thank you, Grant. Excellent presentation. Thanks very much. Welcome. Bye, Ronnie Forbes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Right, Ronnie. For Big Ronnie to go to his bed. <laughs> Just about. It's <laughs> not 10 o'clock, is it? Aye. Some place. Good night, Ronnie. Yeah, well, mate, I'm looking, looking for you. you. No one pairs anyway, well, Ronnie. 54 here. <laughs> right then, Ben, I'm going to give you five. <laughs> Thanks again, Gordon. Thank you, Grant. Well Thank done. you, Gordon. Well done, Grant. 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 Enjoy that. Thank you. Three. Well done, Grant. You saved us, Gordon. Well done, Grant. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Grant. Good night, everyone.